Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. Episode 82, recorded on August 12th, 2020. Azure says, how about them Apple's open usage commons? Good evening, Ryan and Peter. Hey. Hey, hey how's it it's going? Been a, it, it's going well. It's been an interesting week in the cloud. I don't know uh, if you guys have seen the show notes yet, but uh, lots of things going on. We have lots of updates, lots of things to fill you all in on this week here at the Cloud Pod. Excellent. All right. Let's get to it. Let's hit it. There might be, there might be some surprise guests in the show, just so you know. Oh, <laughs> it might happen. Jonathan is unfortunately dealing with a production issue, and so he will not be joining us this evening. We will miss him dearly as we talk about Jedi, his favorite topic. <laughs> First up, out of the date. Uh, There's a quick Jedi to update. Uh, we were supposed to get an update here in August from the government about their reawarding of the Jedi contract uh, based on the revised criteria from the court case. Uh, apparently, they've said they need another month to do that, um, probably because of COVID. That's my guess. Uh, neither Amazon or, nor Microsoft opposed the request for a delay, and so we expect to see uh, an update sometime in September, hopefully, uh, unless, of course, they just keep stalling this out for the election, which well, could happen, too. We'll never know. So Jedi is continuing to go through the core system, continuing to be uh, in the forefront of government spending, unless you want to talk about TikTok, which is the government's bigger issue right now, apparently, and Microsoft wants to buy it. So maybe they can get Jedi contract and TikTok. It's a double win. Wow. You know, I'm, I'm curious to know how much has been spent on the legal end of this um, dispute. When you think about it, it's a $10 billion contract, but really, in the details, there's only a million dollars of annual committed spend. It's like, wouldn't it be cheaper just to commit to a million dollars to both platforms and mm-hmm. actually save all the money on the legal, legal defense? Yeah. yeah. I wonder if they can. Like, you know, with government contracts, it's just, it has to go out to bid. It has to be, you know, the lowest bidder. That, like, I wonder if they're so, like, tangled up in bureaucracy that they really have no power to do anything. I can't do it. Just can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Awful. Yeah. It's either a million dollars in legal fees to do the right thing or a million dollars in legal fees to rewrite all the contracts. Yeah. Uh. Well, the other big news uh, in the world of COVID uh, is that Moderna, who has really one of the leading COVID-19 vaccine trials out there, uh, just entering phase three, has uh, selected Amazon uh, as its partner to help develop the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, They apparently were already a customer of Amazon's web services, so this isn't super exciting, uh, but they were using it for uh, data analytics, machine learning workloads, and now this is helping them do the vaccine workloads as well. Uh, they just entered phase three trials uh, with over about 30,000 human subjects, uh, and they are continuing to work towards uh, getting that vaccine out into the market as much as possible. Uh, they mentioned a little bit of other technology that apparently this is a, uh, you know, with Amazon's help, they built a proprietary technology and method that run on Amazon to create messenger RNA constructs that human cells recognize as being naturally produced in the body. And these apparently help uh, block the COVID va- uh, virus from infecting you. So that's pretty cool. There's a quote here from uh, Moderna's chief executive, Stephanie Bensell. Uh, With AWS, our researchers have the ability to quickly design and execute research experiments and rapidly uncover new insights to get potentially life-saving treatments into production faster. AWS's breadth and depth services are supporting our mission to create a new generation of medicines for patients and are instrumental in our quest to develop a vaccine for COVID-19. So there you go. I'm in. Shoot me up. I'm I'm about a week away from trying Clorox. (laughs) UV light. Yeah. yeah in my mouth. Doesn't that work now? <laughs> yeah. Well, you, I don't know if you saw the news that Russia apparently already has a vaccine. So, you know, if you don't want to get marked by the Moderna one and, you know, the, the mark of the beast from Bill Gates, apparently, which according to the conspiracy theorists, uh, you know, you can get the Russian version. I'll so, take them all. You know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's we'll the line, <laughs> <laughs> Sure, I might grow an ear out of my chest, but, you know, I won't get the virus. So yeah. I won't get the virus. It's all good. Yeah, I, uh, I'm going to wait a little while. I think still for these to get through all the human trials. I don't. I'm not going to be first in line, but I will be very quickly in line. So, but not first. It's never. No one ever wants to be first. That's what I've learned. <laughs> Especially with Amazon services. If it's good enough for goldfish, it's good enough for me. <laughs> 
All right. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's your that's your take. We'll let you we'll let you have that one. Uh, well, you know, if you do want to be first in the race to five G telecommunication uh, technology and f- fast ultra low latency communication and application design, the AWS Wavelength zones are now open for you in Boston and San Francisco, uh, in San Francisco in the Verizon network. Uh, this was announced at reInvent twenty nineteen. Uh, it's this partnership between Verizon and AWS to get these uh, edge compute devices right on the edge of the network uh, to get that fast, fast performance. Uh, the great use cases for this include things like gaming, media processing, e-commerce, social media, medical image analysis, and machine learning uh, inference apps. Uh, getting started is easy as filling out a simple form, and then the uh, you get access to a region that you can find in your described regions. Uh, this is now attached to both the U.S. East 1 region and the U.S. West 2, and they have these lovely names like U.S. East 1-1. WL1 for wavelength, dash boss, dash WLZ for, I think, Verizon there, and dash one. So uh, they make your APIs scream in horror as you type those all out and try to not misspell them, uh, but they are available to you and available. Uh, getting started with this is as simple as setting up a VPC in the new availability zones, just like you would for any other uh, regions or availability zones that you want to add resources to. And then you can basically request an ENI from a carrier, uh, attach that to your EC2 instance, and now have it attached directly to the Verizon network. Uh, you do need to have a, a bash and host to be able to communicate to it or assign a secondary IP address to the instance to actually be able to access it uh, to do troubleshooting or do anything with that. Or, or you need to have a device on the Verizon network, of course. Uh, if you take snapshots of these instances like you typically would want to do for backups, they do get stored in their parent region. Uh, and right now you have a couple different options for instances, including the T3 medium and extra large, the R5 2X large, and the G4 2X large instances. Uh, billing is available to you on demand or via uh, savings plan. Uh, and you can take advantage of things like ECS, EKS, and many of the other services like AIM, CloudFormation, and CloudWatch, all available to you for this. Uh, it is a little bit more pricey than a T3, uh, or you know, the, than they are in a e- US East 1. A T3 medium in wavelength will cost you about $41.66 uh, versus $30.95 it would have cost you in Virginia. So there you go. In other news, Tinder has shaved 100 milliseconds off your next hookup. <laughs> your next swipe right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> One of the interesting things about this article was that they, uh, they talked about the fact that Verizon's their first partner, but they, they made it sound like they want to partner with other uh, telco providers as well. And what we've seen so far is that they're kind of all lining up with different cloud providers, you know, AT&T and, and uh, Sprint and stuff going to Google and Azure, respectively. Um, those are all available, and, and they're doing their own partnerships with those companies. So I, you wonder how soon this gets commoditized where they all realize they all have to be on everyone else's clouds. Yeah. Uh, to Inevitable. To you. It, it will happen eventually. Yeah. Just like the iPhone, you know, eventually had to leave AT and T's grasp and go to the world. Well, uh, I have a you know an interesting article here. So um, if you listen to the show regularly, you know we have ads from our great uh, friend of the show, Foghorn Secure, uh, Foghorn Consulting, uh, where Peter comes from. Uh, and in those ads, you know they like to tell us all about the great things they do. But you know what they haven't told us about is that they have a, a service for you to get started quickly in the cloud called VPC in a box. And apparently. We just found out about this at the Cloud Pod because they have a press release with Amazon <laughs> where they announced that they have this great solutions offer, consulting offer called VPC in a Box, which helps you simplify your VPC creation, configuration, and optimization to seamlessly connect to AWS availability zones within Amazon regions and around the world. Uh, so I guess that's pretty nice. It does currently come in three tiers, Express, Production, and Enterprise. And Peter, what do you have to say for yourself that our listeners are just learning about VPC in a Box here with this press release? Well... Maybe they learned about it before because we've, I think our first blog post on VPC in a box was in like 2015, but I could be wrong. It might not be a blog post, but um, we did have t-shirts for that reinvent that said step one, VPC in a box. Uh, and, Which is uh, great. It's wonderful. <laughs> Which they, is they the, the natural hit, way actually. to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but we just recently got, the reason it came out with Amazon is because Amazon just recently vetted it and put it up on their AWS vetted solutions, consulting solution space. So that was super exciting to see. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just fun to see our name out there with stuff that Amazon is putting out. Yeah, it was, uh, it was funny because I saw VPC in a box uh, in my news feed you know, as I started pulling together show notes. And I was like, oh, someone stole Foghorn's you know, thing. And then I read the article. <laughs> no, it is Foghorn's VPC in a box. <laughs> So, uh, apparently, you also got a certification on your other offering, your Fog 360 security package, uh, which is your ability to uh, provide a comprehensive security analysis and visualization services that updates and automates a previously complex and manual process uh, through your Fog 360 opportunity. So, two great uh, Foghorn solutions this week. 
that we don't talk about in the ad, but we really should. Yeah, it's my fault. Actually, I blame <laughs> Alex. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you have interest, please ping us. And uh, I'm sure Justin will do a great job of getting me the info. I, I will make sure you get it, yes. Well, after they uh, they you know paraded around how excited they are about Foghorn uh, and your great solutions, which is great, and congratulations on being in their, their marketplace. That's awesome. Uh, they announced... Uh, AWS App Mesh has a new default mesh configuration, uh, so you can now leverage a new default mesh retry policy and connection pool configuration that simplifies building application resilience to connection errors and improves application scalability. Uh, this is a way to simplify your application architecture without having to worry about things like retries or connection pooling, and it's really trying to be the easy button for you to get onto the App Mesh and make resilient, reliable uh, communication protocols available to your applications. Uh, they say this is a simple plug-and-play operation, but uh, I'm not sure I exactly agree with that but that's what they're claiming so there you go maybe it's plug and play as compared to what you have to do without it yeah i'm not sure i'm exactly on board with this pattern like if you don't have like air handling and retry built into the app logic and you're just outsourcing that to the infrastructure is that actually going to lead to more resilient apps like i get you know temporary failures of dns resolution or network blips you know will be handled seamlessly but so many of the other things that you need retries for aren't will probably be missed because it's, it's built into the mesh. We're fine. Yeah, well, they're, they're, right. only giving you two, they're only giving you two attempts. So if it fails for two attempts, you're host. Um, so you still probably need to think about how you design this, but for people who are still working on that code or are doing retrofitting in the cloud, this gives you some level of resiliency, uh, but not really what I would consider to be the panacea of uh, resiliency. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting you know concept with you know I mean mesh in general is interesting and just you know the, it's the new the new network in a lot of ways and so to see how they're taking this new construct and adding things that aren't part of traditional networks is is fascinating. My networks is. There's probably use cases where it makes a ton of sense, and then there's probably some things we should not rely on it for, like everything, right? <laughs> yeah. No. Exactly. <laughs> Always test. Make sure you do it in a lab first. My seatbelt's on. I can close my eyes while I'm driving now. (laughs) AWS Glue version 2.0 is now available to you, featuring a 10x faster job start time and a one-minute minimum billing duration. Uh, Of course, Amazon Amazon Glue is a fully managed ETL service that makes it easy for customers to prepare and load their data for analytics. Uh, I know many people who told me they're not big fans of Glue. So I think Amazon also got that message in that if they had just released these features, people wouldn't give it the right proper uh, retry. But by naming it the Glue version 2.0, I think they're trying to get the idea that this is something new and different and you should try it again. Uh, And this is a Spark ETL job processor, of course, that helps uh, get things started. With 10x faster startup times, uh, this allows you to do more uh, to basically provide better <laughs> micro-batching capabilities and time-sensitive workloads and increase business productivity by enabling interactive script development and data exploration capabilities. And then with your Spark jobs, they're now more predictable. Uh, you're now only building one-second increments with a lower minimum billing duration uh, from 10 minutes previously to one minute minimum. So a lot of those micro-transaction, micro-batches um, are all available to you through this capability now. And so I've heard from some people who've complained to me about Glue in the past that this actually might make them take a serious hard look at it again, which when I read this initially, I was like, well, that's not enough to make people like glue, but apparently it was. Well, the promise of glue is fantastic. Like I want glue to work. Like, you know, I've tried to use it a few times and, and it just doesn't work for most use cases. And that's part of the problem, right? So unless, you know, the 10 minute minimum was always a thing. And so making updates, you always had to do carefully or costs were going to balloon out of control. Um, and then, you know, if you had a small data set and the fact how long it took to actually get that transformed, you're sort of, you know, like, man, I could do this other ways, um, especially for smaller data sets. So, yeah, I, I'm hoping this is going to right the ship and, and start moving it directly to the promise that they originally envisioned and communicated when this came out. Yeah, I mean, the idea of a serverless batch processing capability that does transforms and extracts and, and all that stuff that you typically do with cron or scheduled tasks or all these other crazy things, um, you know, it, the dream is great. I just, it wasn't quite the reality with the version one. So version two might be the future and, and maybe we'll see a lot more use cases, which I'm super excited about. And let's not forget that they named it Glue because the predecessor to Glue had a bad rep, which was Data Pipeline. So, oh, yes, Data Pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's so funny, right? It's this thing that everybody wants, and I guess it's a lot harder to do than it looks because Amazon's pretty darn good at putting together these managed services, and 
yeah, this one still uh, still hasn't hit the mark. Yeah, well, definitely curious to see what people have to say and what we see at reInvent and different things with solutions that people are showcasing. And hopefully it does enable a lot of really great new use cases. So yeah, we'll see. for sure. Commvault is data management done differently. Commvault knows how important your data is to your business, enabling you to learn more about your data, manage your data, move your data securely and efficiently, and quickly recover your data to meet critical business needs. Available as a cloud-based software as a service solution, deployed on your existing on-premise virtualization environment, or as an appliance-based offering, their simple and centralized web interface lets you synchronize your data between on-premise data centers and your cloud environments, keeping downtime due to failures at a minimum. With Commvault, you can translate your virtual workloads to a cloud provider automatically, greatly simplifying the move to the cloud or your disaster recovery solution to the cloud. Commvault supports over 40 different cloud vendors, giving you the ability to use the cloud that is right for your business. To learn how Commvault can help you manage your data differently, save money, and reduce risk, head to www.thecloudpod.net slash Commvault to find out more and schedule your free trial of their SaaS offering. Well, uh, moving on to our friends at GCP. Uh, after last week's uh, just swing and a miss by both Azure and GCP, they've come back with a vengeance this week, uh, which is good. You know, it's, we like to see all of our cloud providers uh, providing features and capabilities for all of you out there in cloud land who are trying to do business on the cloud. So, the first one uh, was just a you know kind of acknowledgement that they are saying, uh, you know. Google Cloud's partner opportunity will probably triple by 2025, which means that they're expecting to see Google Cloud continue to be a rocket ship uh, going in the right direction. And companies will be coming to them for cloud technology and services uh, that are growing rapidly as businesses embark on their digital transformations. And Google Cloud partners are particularly well planned to help customers plan and execute their digital transformation strategy. Uh, and they said that Google's GCP partners are typically leading the way on digital transformation for a lot of their customers. Uh, and so this is a great opportunity for people uh, who are trying to get into the GCP cloud to take advantage of those partner opportunities uh, from people like Foghorn, for it, in fact. Uh, and, you know, that's something great to do. So definitely, if you're looking at GCP and you're looking at all this great cool, cool cloud next uh, content and you're saying, we want to get on that, reach out to your partners because they are looking to help you do that digital transformation. And uh, then reach out to Foghorn after you reached out to your existing partner. <laughs> <laughs> or don't reach out to them and just reach out to Foghorn. Yeah, or just yeah. come straight to us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the... Uh, Google acknowledges that the cloud is hard and security in the cloud is particularly difficult when you get into things like IAM or into you know, simple questions like how can I isolate my containerized workload, you know, how do I protect my web app against DDoS attacks, etc. And so to help with this, they've released a collection of 50 plus uh, step-by-step videos which will guide you through the very specific security challenges or use cases uh, complete with actionable information to help you solve that specific issue so there's sure to be something for every security professional out there. Uh, there's a quite a list of great topics uh, and I do recommend checking these out. They are available on their YouTube channel, and they have also made a very handy YouTube playlist to help you get through these. Uh, but you know, any of your questions, they have a video, which is really great. I think 80% of our new customers, our first engagement is focused around security, and as much as I wish it were magic, um, this is definitely something where a little bit of education goes so far to getting a comfort level. So all of this information, as much as uh, it scares me that customers aren't going to come to us anymore. I'm sure they will. But uh, it is, um, it, it's so valuable to put this stuff out and to watch it and just get, ed- don't be scared by it, get educated a little bit and quickly it won't be as scary. And most people who are on the cloud for a couple of years start feeling like they're, they're scared to put something somewhere that's not in the cloud for fear of security. This is a great way to get going. Yeah. Well, I think the, the great thing about this is even when you kind of know when something new comes out, right, and you're like, well, I don't really know what the use case is for that, or I'm not really sure how to even get started, you know, a quick little video, you know, it's a couple of minutes long, and it gives you kind of a quick overview, and here's how to get started, and here's resources to go learn more. I think that's really great uh, on-ramp to the cloud in many ways for many people who are self-starters and really just want to learn this stuff uh, without working through you know, very complicated documentation or trying to just figure it out on their own and get stuck and get frustrated. And so I think these are great opportunities for, you know, really quick videos that help you get started and get you through the door, which I think is great. I kind of, I like the form factor of like, you know, you know, how, how can I isolate a containerized workload, this question and an answer. I kind of, since I don't like learning by video, um, wish that they sort of offered that same sort of format. Like I know they also, um, 
uh, launched a whole bunch of security best practices and, and white papers, and those are different. Those are great. Those are good resources. But I also kind of wish that you know the, there was more written documentation for these, like very straightforward, like here's how you do this, or here's an example of how you do this. Like user story. A little bit. I mean, the same thing that they're putting in the video is just you know sort of written written in a little bit more direct so way. They might have listened to you proactively, Ryan. I don't know. Uh, so they are also releasing the Google Cloud Security's Best Practices Center, uh, which is a new web destination that helps deliver world-class security expertise from Google and their partners. Uh, the expertise comes in the form of security blueprints, guides, white papers, and, and more help that you can access via Slack and all kinds of other th- opportunities to reach out and get that assistance really quickly. Um, so I think they are hearing you as well because I also sort of share that that anti-millennial side of I don't like video. <laughs> I just want to read it. Uh, but, you know, they also have these great blueprints. They have these guys, these white papers. This is all available to you as well. Uh, that was announced last week at the Security Week of uh, Google Cloud Next. So the Google Cloud Security Best Practices Center. Oh, cool. Okay. So that, that I, you know, because I, I read the announcement and I had a little bit more than I thought then. with Because blueprints and guides are exactly what, what I'm looking for. Yeah, so this actually was the second article after the they, – they did two press releases because they like to double dip. Uh, the first one was the Security Showcase, which I think is really great entry level uh, and really gets people started. And then I think they're more in-depth when you're saying, okay, I, I need more than five minutes on IAM. <laughs> you know, that's where you get into these blueprints. You get into these, these different areas of best practices. Uh, multi-region configurations for Spanner have been expanded to include Asia and Europe. Uh, Google Cloud Spanner, of course, is its massively scalable relational database service, uh, which has launched two multi-region Spanners uh, in both Asia and Europe. These are 99.99% available. Uh, more regions allow you to deliver high quality and unified customer experiences to users around the world while ensuring very high availability. And they have a quote here from Masaki Miyamoto, manager director of Zero Bank Design Factory Company, LTD. Uh, for our digital native banking system currently under development, we needed a database that can scale seamlessly based on demand, offers external strong consistent consistency, good performance, and has extremely high availability for us to deliver an unmatched experience to our consumers. We found Spanner to be the only relational database that meets our needs. We are glad that now Spanner offers an Asia multi-region configuration that delivers 98.999% availability SLA, enabling us to build applications for high business continuity with infinite scale. Accenture is supporting us to develop our banking systems. This is active, active, right? Yes, it is. Which is the fun part. Yeah, that's the one that that's like the holy grail. And now it's just a matter of okay, let's see what they've done around the options around latency versus potential right conflicts and stuff. That's super- I mean, if you are concerned about lock in, uh, I'm not sure Spanner is going to help you out in that scenario. But I think <laughs> it is really great. <laughs> well, it's, you know, like you know, it's. Depends on the use case, right? Like, are you locked in for all your applications, or are you locked in for your applications where you really need that active-active relational data layer? So it's, it's. I, I think that that's. Yeah, and I know I'm preaching the choir a little bit on the show. You know, that's the. It's the the multi-cloud strategy, is a little different than people usually conceptualize it and speak about it. Yep. There's lock-in everywhere. Is the yeah. other way to look at it. You can't yep. get away. From I, it. Actually, I just was interviewed, uh, and the article dropped today. And I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, but you know, basically, I had a whole article about cloud lock-in and why you shouldn't be as worried uh, about it. And Corey's in there, Corey Quinn, as well as uh, an venture capitalist uh, who uh, has a couple of article quotes in there, as well as my my insights and thoughts on this as well. If you have not heard it here on the show previously, so do check that out if you're interested in learning more about cloud lock-in and, and how I think about it. Well, if you uh, if you're using BigQuery, uh, you know there's several different ways to pay for BigQuery, uh, and one of them we talked about here on the show last year, I believe, was the highly flexible pricing options for enterprise customers, which gives them a flat rate billing model uh, that's predictable and gives businesses direct control over costs and performance. Uh, and when they announced this last year, uh, you had to buy this in 500 slots, and these slots are basically reserve capacity units. Uh, and so 500 slots may not be really great for a small startup or a company that's just starting trying to get started with BigQuery and doesn't want to have that unpredictable cost nature. Uh, so Google listened to our complaints here on the show <laughs> and is apparently now reducing this to now allow you to buy 100 slots at a time to get started faster and quicker. Uh, the change allows you to purchase 100 slots at a time, purchase them in increments of 100, and applies to all commitment types from flex, monthly, and annual uh, if you'd like to get some of these slots. Uh, an annual contract, contract will cost you about $1,700 a month for 100 slots a month. Uh, monthly commitments are about $2,000 a month, and the 100 flexible slots would basically work out to be about $4 per hour uh, for BigQuery. So that's pretty great. Uh, great way to get into this and really start getting some use cases out of it uh, quite quickly. Yeah, I'm happy to see the you know the on-demand pricing structure come 
come here. You know, like it's being able to pay per hour or in smaller chunks makes it very, very usable to people that it was unattainable to use this before. So that's cool. Yeah, I think so. I guess the one other thing to say about that is uh, that what's not even mentioned in, in there is their free tier, which is also pretty darn good. Wow, you're just setting up these segues, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so actually Google talked about their free tier as well this week. Uh, they're continuing to add new services to their free tier with now over 20 services that will always be free, uh, as well as they're extending their $300 credit for new customers for the first 90 days uh, to allow you to try all the great Amazon services, including BigQuery, uh, before you buy those slots. Uh, the free trial now comes with better training, including 30 days of unlimited Quick Labs training, as well as 60 on-demand webinars, videos, training courses, and more. Uh, I mentioned earlier there's a Slack channel, which I did join, uh, as well as Google Cloud Communities and a Reddit uh, that they are now making available to get that training quickly, efficiently, and in the way you want to get it, uh, which is great. But it's part of your free trial. And yes, that means I now have like 20 Slack teams that I'm part of. <laughs> <laughs> that left call. I'm pretty sure they're going to need folders for Slack teams. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. Hey, everyone. Jonathan here. I just wanted to take a minute to thank the cloud consulting gurus at Foghorn for helping make the cloud pod possible. These folks truly get it. Cloud consulting experts since 2008, they are premier tier partners with AWS, Google Cloud Platform Silver, and Microsoft Azure partners. From multi-cloud to containers to moving full production workloads to the cloud under the tightest compliance, Foghorn's team of full-stack cloud engineers have been there, done that, gotten the t-shirt, and are ready to share their experience with you. If you're in the market for some talent to supplement your team, visit www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod. Foghorn, the promise of cloud delivered. Well, moving on to Azure. Uh, so, you know, we talked a lot about Google and Istio and how upset the open source community was that they donated or do, are going to donate uh, Istio to the uh, open whatever thing Google is. I can't remember the name of <laughs> 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 open usage commons. Yeah, open usage commons, yeah. yes. The OUC. Uh, so Microsoft said, yeah, you know what? Uh, we can help you out with this. So Microsoft has announced that it's created a new open source service mesh based on the Envoy proxy server, and it's planning to hand over control of the project to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation in a few weeks' time. They're calling this the open service mesh, and is designed to help companies deal with the complexity of managing microservices, which are the components of modern software applications. Uh, they go on to talk about how complicated Istio is and how difficult it is to actually use and so this was designed to be a more simple, more approachable way to get an abstraction layer, abstraction layer to communicate with microservices, uh, and they are excited to donate this to the CNCF uh, for future partnerships. I just wish they would have named it the Open Service Mesh with Istio compatibility. <laughs> oh, that would have been... Well, then they would have really got to test out that Open Usage Commons uh, copyright portion, you know, really see how, see how legally sta- binding that actually is. If it, yeah. <laughs> You know, this is this goes right in line with more competition, and this is you know I I not a big fan of this move by Google. I think that this is a you know this is a very limiting move to choose your own foundation, um, and it you know quite frankly it steers me away from using Istio. And so I've I've already played around with Envoy, and if we can get a standard around how to do that, that and that's backed by Microsoft, so be it. So it makes it much more appealing to me. It's so great. How, I mean, Google, one of the biggest companies in the world, tries to just flex the tiniest little muscle in the open source community, and boom, the door opens and Microsoft steps in. I just love the, I love the dynamic that's going on and that open source drives. It's so much fun. Uh, it was interesting, too, because this article mentioned there are several other service mesh technologies out there. I don't know if you knew about these, because uh, I, I didn't. Uh, but there's the Buoyant Inks Linkerd, uh, which I had heard of Linkerd, but I didn't really know it that well. And then Kong's uh, has a solution as well that I'm forgetting the name of this moment. As I t- when I type in the show notes, it can't be right because it's spelled wrong. But uh, oh, Kong's uh, Kuma. Uh, is their solution. And so uh, very, very interesting uh, that there are a couple other solutions out there that I was not aware of in this space. Yeah, Linkerd has been around forever, but I think Linkerd 2, right, is the sort yes, of service right. meshy one. Correct. And then Kong, you know, who's been making a big deal in API gateways for quite a while now, uh, you know, really, especially after Apogee got bought by Google, they're really one of the last freestanding uh, companies out there doing you know, API Gateway. So it's interesting to see that they've thought they need to build their own service mesh as well versus just plugging into Envoy or some other technology. So really interesting. I hadn't heard of Kong. And then 
I was reading the show notes and then I literally flipped over to a web browser and I got an ad for Kong and I was like, that is just so creepy. <laughs> <laughs> it is very creepy. Uh, I met their VP of engineering at a conference uh, at reInvent actually a couple years ago. Um, and you know, they, he was trying to sell me on all the great things about their API gateway and why I should move to it. But uh, we were very happy where we're at, so I, we didn't pursue it. But uh, you know, it definitely was interesting to hear kind of their, his take on it and you know, Amazon services versus others. So it's good. Yeah, Amazon service mesh is also based on Envoy as well, and so it's sort of like the two. They're all the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, it's really just the control tier of Envoy is all you're really dealing with at this point. Yeah. Everything's Envoy under the hood, or yeah. sidecars of some kind, and then you're basically just doing that with um, you know Istio, or now with this new open service mesh, you're you're getting basically the control tier, how to configure it, how to specify endpoints, etc., and the rules for that. So that's what you're really getting out of these other layers uh, above Envoy. Mm-hmm. It's just that's the hard part, right? Like that's yeah. Well, I mean, it's like containers were the easy part. Kubernetes mm-hmm. is the hard part. Right. <laughs> right. So, exactly. Yeah. Well, the other, uh, if you're using the Azure Cloud Shell tools uh, and you've had a bone to pick with them for a while, maybe about a feature or something that's broken, uh, this is now open source. And you can now uh, go make pull requests to uh, Microsoft Azure and they will review them and potentially add them to the open sh- uh, the Cloud Shell tool in the next release. Of course, this is their browser based authenticated shell experience to manage your cloud resources, very similar to uh, Google's Cloud Shell. Uh, this is basically a really quick uh, way to get to a shell access to your cloud right from the console, which is really great. And these are really gr- fantastic tools, both Azure's and Google's. Uh, this is one of those features that I, I'm sort of jealous that I don't have an AWS. Yeah, exactly. Cough, cough. <laughs> exactly. Please, please bring this to me one day. Yeah. Uh, SSM doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it does not. <laughs> this total positive byproduct of companies being forced to embrace open source is now we're paying for the actual resources we're using, and we're using open source software, and then those companies that are getting money from us using their resources are like, why wouldn't you want to open source all this stuff and get the whole community working on your behalf to make your service better? Well, I mean, on one way of it, I I sort of feel like you, you know, like this Azure shell, there's no way for you to use the shell unless it's running inside Azure. So I don't really know what you're, you know, you're really contributing software to a, you know, multi-billion dollar in revenue company. You are, but Uh, you're not. But on the other side of it, when something's really bothering me that you haven't fixed in the code for six months, I can go fix it and give them a pull request and make myself happy. That that does make me happy, too. So it's this kind of weird double-edged sword sometimes. It makes you feel bad about yourself, doesn't it? Even though it's helping, <laughs> even though you're doing it consciously because you want it done and it's beneficial for you to do it, it's like, I feel bad I'm contributing this. But it's, I just think it's cool and I, I'm hoping that um, this is what the world looks like um, more and more as we move forward. As long as they actually, you know, review these and merge them in. I don't know how many PRs I have outstanding that are just abandoned, you know, uh, like contributed yeah. to some abandoned where it's just sitting there waiting lonely for a review. Or worse, they don't review them and merge them in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Azure is now releasing the new NCAS T4 V3 VM. Ooh, that's rough. That's uh, virtual machines and a new addition to the Azure GPU family designed for AI and ML needs. The new VMs feature four NVIDIA T4 GPUs with 16 gigs of memory each and up to 64 non-multi-threaded AMD Epic V. Uh, 7 V12 Rome processor cores and 480 gigs of system memory. These are available to you in preview. So I don't have pricing because they're in preview, which is the problem. <laughs> and I still don't have any use case to use anything like this machine. Just I mean, you wouldn't be able to remember the name of it when no. you did want to use it. So, <laughs> and in fact, because I couldn't remember what it was, I, if I, even if I saw it on a drop down, I'd be like, oh, that looks expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm still using GPUs for graphics processing. Call me crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. I got, that's what I that's what I do to play Quake, right? Like, yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, so great. Uh, well, and the last Azure announcement this week is they are extending the Azure Service Bus to now support JMS. Uh, two over AMQP protocol or the advanced messaging queuing protocol. Of course, the Azure Service Bus is a fully managed pass offering with deep integrations between Azure services. And by supporting uh, JMS Service Two uh, over AMQP, they are now uh, uh, sorry they have this available to you in the premium tier. Uh, and customers can now seamlessly lift and shift their Java and Spring workloads to Azure while also helping them modernize their application stack with best-in-class enterprise messaging in the cloud. Per the press release. 
So that's a little uh, of a retreat a little bit, right? I don't, I'm not familiar with the uh, AMQP, you know, protocol, but is that, I assume that's Azure specific. No, AMQP is uh, open. So is there's, it? there's, okay. yeah, this is the same thing that powers AWS MQ. Uh, this is a very popular Java oh, okay. message queuing platform that's out there all over the place. Uh, if you're not using Kafka, this is probably what you're using. In most, or if you're <laughs> if you're not using Kafka, you're not using RabbitMQ. You're most likely using AMQP. I think <laughs> so, uh-huh. that's how that works. So is this replacing this, or is it just adding JMS on top of it? It's just adding JMS on top. Of oh, it. all right. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, then I stand corrected. But which, I mean, having JMS two gives you basically a lot more access uh, for Java and Spring workloads. Yeah, that makes sense. sense. Yeah. And then uh, our final story for the night is Oracle. Uh, and Oracle slips into the store. Uh, with the US2 of US2 announcements, they're announcing the global availability of Oracle Cloud VMware solution. Yes, they now, too, have VMware, just like Google, just like Amazon, and just like Azure. So US2 is fully in place. Uh, they have a couple interesting things in this press release that I would like to mention. Uh, is they think their VMware solution is differentiated and much better than all the others. And they say this because, mostly from a security perspective. Uh, they have a lovely table that I did not link to in our show notes, but is in the actual article if you guys want to follow along with me. Uh, they all have the same features of NSX-T, vSphere, vSAN, vCenter, HCX. So that's nothing special. Uh, but then on the security side, uh, they mentioned that customers will always own their root credentials uh, and Oracle will not have access to them versus AWS, Azure, and GCP. They say has all of those things. Uh, which I'm not actually sure on Amazon they do because I think in AWS it's actually managed by VMware, but you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna quibble on little things like that I guess. Uh, and then uh, in the billing case, uh, Oracle is now fully consolidating your VMware bill and your Oracle OCI bill, uh, where you get separate bills from AWS and VMware because VMware is managing it. Just I just pointed out. And then GCP is also consolidated, so they're equal there. Uh, support is from Oracle uh, versus third party support for Azure and GCP and VMware for AWS. Uh, again, I don't know how well Oracle can support VMware versus VMware supporting VMware, but you know they think it's a different trader, so I'm going to call it out. And then updates, patches, and upgrades are controlled by the customer in the Oracle cloud versus the other cloud providers force those upgrades on you. Uh, and then availability is available to you in all 19 Oracle cloud regions uh, versus three and two in Azure and, and GCP and 17 in AWS. And then one of the big things is uh, they support 64 uh, maximum hosts in the SDDC, which is the software defined data center for those playing at home. Uh, and that is 64 of those versus 16 on AWS and 16 on Azure. And GCP matches them with 64 as well. And then for vCenter access, you get full access with Oracle, uh, where you only get restricted access from the other three. So they think they're differentiated in those areas, and those are things that you uh, really desperately wanted, and you want to be able to be behind on your VMware upgrades. Uh, you now have that capability to do that with Oracle Cloud. That's the first thing I thought of. Yeah. I just have to say, I think it's brilliant, because Oracle's targeting people who aren't interested in a like a fully managed VMware solution where you lose some control, but you get this management. And what a greater way to differentiate than giving, because it's tough. Obviously, it's going to be really tough for Oracle to catch up you know, to the, to the other providers. How great to say, we're different because we're going to give you less than the others give you because there is a significant group of people who want less. They want more control. They don't want that management layer. And, and for some reason, the other cloud providers aren't offering that as an option. So, hey, we're, we're different because we give you less. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> it's an interesting play, isn't it? I had yeah. not thought of that. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. like some people need the, I bet there's just like people who can't go to RDS because they've got like um, root scripts running on their box and, and they're not allowed to run on, you know, obviously you can't run that on RDS, so they can't go to RDS. I bet there's similar uh, concepts for people who are have all their processes of, Tied proprietary stuff into VMware, and and this makes the baby step. This makes the step to the cloud possible without doing any reengineering. Yeah, well, actually, there's interesting here because you, you mentioned that because that's exactly what Helder Branko says, the CTO of Intel, who was quoted in this article. Uh, he says Intel migrated over 60 production applications to Oracle Cloud infrastructure, including our mission critical customer engagement, business intelligence, and risk management systems. We have a strong technical team, including many VMware experts. So a managed VMware service is not helpful to us. We need administrative access to the VMware software so we can maintain control of every aspect of the VMware environment. Oracle Cloud VMware solutions offer my team the exact same VMware experience they had 
cloud in the data center, both the cloud elasticity and access to Oracle cloud services, providing a fast and easy and cost-effective path to migrate our VMware-based applications to the cloud. And as a result, performance has increased dramatically, downtime is close to zero, and we have been seeing a 50% dis- decrease in the number of customer support tickets. So. Yeah, just super strong uh, example, mostly in that most people probably think you said Intel. But really, it's Intel. 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 Yeah. yeah, I know. It's, yeah. I know. Uh, but yeah, you know, so I read that and I look and go like, well, I don't want to be a VMware expert. I want to be an expert in the apps that I provide yeah. on the cloud. So, I mean, everyone has their own opinions and I don't sign up for that particular one. But for customers who do want that, I guess this is a great option. And so, again, I'm not saying it's bad. It, it is an us two announcement, but it's it's us two in a different way. And I think some customers will like it. So yeah. that's here in the show notes. And they made the cloud pod. And they made the cloud pod, it's which pretty impressive. Oracle does occasionally. We, we do drop them up here occasionally, mm-hmm. especially during Oracle Open World and other times. But uh, yeah, hey, there you go. Well, that's it for main show topics. Uh, Peter, you want to take us to lightning round? Yes. Amazon VPC Flow Logs extends CloudFormation support to custom format subscriptions and one-minute aggregation intervals and tagging. I mean, it's CloudFormation, so you're never actually going to see that one-minute aggregation interval because CloudFormation takes at least 10 minutes to run. Yeah. Yes. Stack updating. Stack updating. And, then, and then that's if you're constantly refreshing your browser to see what's happening. Correct. <laughs> right. Amazon. Why don't they have an auto refresh on that page yet? Like, I do all these know. years, you still don't have an auto refresh. Ugh. They refreshed the UI and didn't add it. Like, it's, it's insanity to me. AP, maybe it's API limits. They don't want to exceed their own API limits. Ooh, must, must be. be must be. It. Must be. It. Amazon Lex launches accuracy improvements and confidence scores. I mean, because all you want is Lex to misinterpret what you say when you're trying to do something important. Like, I like 10 cans of canned food. You'd like 10,000 cans of canned food. See, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, you want that confidence in that answer. And, you know, with all these improvements and, and confidence, you know, it's, it's like someone who likes CrossFit. It's Lex, so they'll never stop talking about it. <laughs> yes, that's true. Well, so that's a good question. Do they talk about Alexa or do they talk about their Alexa skills or do they have their Lex skills? Because I feel like... It could go either way. With, could be. With this. Yeah. Amazon Transcribe launches custom language models. Finally, I can start adding custom uh, pig Latin to my transcribe. <laughs> nice. That would be friggin' awesome if you did that, man. <laughs> <laughs> AWS AppSync releases direct Lambda resolvers for GraphQL APIs. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> I hit all the buzzwords. <laughs> Amazon Elastic Container Service launches more network metrics for containers using the EC2 launch type. Why is it so specific? Why why the EC2 launch type? And then the network metrics I need to know is, is it taking traffic or not? And have I exceeded the throughput of the instance type? That's the only metric I need because that's the one that burns me every time. Every single time. It's got to be because that was the one launch type that was not previously supported which again that's a weird weird issue yeah <laughs> i'm not sure though i mean yeah because it's it's you can do enis instead of vpc for fargate launch types and so this is this is it's it was oddly specific for me too like and now i'm questioning whether since i don't use fargate is this available on fargate or is this just ec2 i don't know i'll have to go look amazon api gateway http apis now support wildcard custom domain names so just like your wildcard domain, your security can now have an asterisk behind it too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> AWS Fargate for Amazon EKS are now included in compute savings plans. I mean, there's only one way to make your ROI work out for Kubernetes. It's put it in the compute savings plan. Oh, my, sure. my favorite part about this is the Sophie's Choice because you have to choose either ECS or EKS in, in, this, in the, it's the compute savings plan. So it's, oh. you, can't, you can't do both. Yeah. Choose your favorite. Oh. <laughs> is that true? I thought I thought computing is kind of typically just by dollar of compute hour, unless you're doing instances. But in Fargate, is it is it that specificity to it? I haven't done well, the Fargate. Well, when I when I read this, it says you could choose either ECS or Fargate. Or I mean, sorry, EC, it's both Fargate work types. So EC2's compute is included as part of the EC2 if you're using uh, EC2 launch types. But the wording of this makes me think that you have to choose either ECS on Fargate or EKS on Fargate to I don't be know. included. I don't know because I think I'm trying to think about the billing. I think that Amazon just shows all this as EC2, don't they? Well, not Fargate. 
Okay. You know, Fargate's its own line item. Uh, you know, the whole point that you have to have a different Fargate cluster for EKS and ECS just annoys me too because mm-hmm. I really just want Fargate to be some middleman that takes my input from either EKS or ECS and just makes it happen. <laughs> yeah. But that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Uh, there's a new digital course, configure and deploy AWS private link. Yeah, it's a quick course, I guess. What, like six to ten minutes tops? <laughs> like it's click, 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 private link there. You didn't secure it, but it's there. Like, it works perfect. Yeah, so they have a new digital course, and no one will actually go watch it, much like they don't read the documentation to do those six clicks. And yeah. I will still have to explain to them how to do it. Yeah, that's true. And then they complain. And then they complain. Uh, Serverless Bot Framework adds support for securely integrating with third-party APIs. Which just tells me that AWS really is Skynet. I love that this this new announcement is that they're supporting API keys. It's like this whole <laughs> thing is just because you can now put the basic security mechanism in place. <laughs> the bare minimum bar of security has now been achieved. <laughs> Thank you, AWS. Yes, that's yeah. awesome. Yonner C. Uh, Nerwa, is that pig? What's wow. that for? Uh, you need that. You need that Amazon for Ryan Wins. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I tried to do pig Latin for Ryan Wins. I don't know if I did that right. <laughs> uh, I felt pretty awesome. good about that asterisk for in your security department now. <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> I, I you got to realize that everyone's rooting for the underdog, Justin. I know. And he's, he's, you gotta, I'm yeah. quite the underdog at this point. <laughs> you got to go. You got to go above and be like, you got to. It's I like know. the opposite really of boxing. It. It's like yeah. the opposite of boxing, where the where the champion you have to beat the champion. Here, if you're on the top of the mountain, everyone wants to knock you down. Yeah, I know. I get it. It's fine. It's all good. I'm not bitter whatsoever. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, yeah. Ryan's coming up though. He's only three off of Jonathan and five off of me. So he's you can still catch up. There's still plenty of year left. It's only 19. like we're just past the halfway point. So as long as we continue to record shows, you're going to be good to go. Yeah, and That's as awesome. long as I keep breaking Jonathan's production systems right before showtime. Then. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, then you'll be able to make it to the thing. <laughs> Nice. Uh, all right well guys that is another week in the cloud uh i you know I, google next continues i've totally forgotten about it other than i see press releases mentioning google cloud next digital i'm like oh yeah that was last week <laughs> i forgot i know uh, I, so feel I, bad. I, I, I feel bad too but I, you know it was interesting i actually saw salesforce uh they actually just completely canceled dreamforce the digital version so they were gonna they were gonna do dreamforce digital and i think after seeing some of these other kind of lackluster events uh they were just like you know what it's better not to do it at all so they're they're not going to do it, which I think I think it's maybe not a bad call because I think it's not a I bad think, call. I think you can get you know all the hype out of you know a three you know like do a two hour you know media event like Apple does for a new iPhone, present all the new stuff, and then basically just make all that available to me on the web either as <laughs> YouTube videos or as you know knowledge based articles or you know walk through how tos. I think I think that's more effective. I think it, you get a lot more buzz, you get a lot more splash for the announcements, you get the kind of same impact of that one week at reInvent, but. You get it in a much more condensed thing versus trying to take this content and just stretch it out. It's just brutal. Yep. Yeah, it's hard. All right, guys. Well, we will talk to you next week here at the Clap Pot. Absolutely. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. Later. And that is the Week in Cloud. We would like to thank our sponsors, Foghorn Consulting and Commvault. Check out our website, the home of the Cloud Pod, where you can join our newsletter, Slack team, send feedback, or ask questions at thecloudpod.net, or tweet us with the hashtag poundthecloudpod. Pound the Cloud Pod.